this song I love the reminder of worship that it brings and in 2 Samuel David is celebrating he's dancing in the streets he's making a fool out of himself because he achieved bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to its home back to the place where it should be and his wife is looking at him and saying what are you doing <laughs> you need to stop but I loved his response to her because he said David retorted to Michael I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. 
He appointed me as the leader of Israel and the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, and I am willing to look more foolish than this, even to, the humiliate, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you, you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. And so while she was embarrassed and she was upset and she was worried about the popular opinion of what was happening in that moment of worship, David said, I don't care because I'm worshiping the God who made this happen and he used me to do it. And I love that we're going we're gonna to hit on that more today, but, but just in this moment, I just want to pray for us to lay down the things that have us worried about our reputations, lay down the things that have us worried about looking foolish, um, especially the things that God uses to bring his kingdom glory. Because I think it's a pretty good trade-off, right? It's a pretty good trade-off to say, I'll look foolish for you, God, if it advances your kingdom, if it points people's eyes to you, I will indeed look foolish. And so I just want to pray that for us today. I just want to pray that we'll lay those things down that are holding us back. Jesus, thank you. I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for every role and every season and every place our lives represent. And Jesus, I pray you would just bring us to a place where we wouldn't be embarrassed to look foolish for you. God, when we're worshiping, we would worship with everything that we have with arms raised, with voices lifted, with hearts positioned, and understanding that what you've done for us, we could never do for ourselves. Jesus, I just pray for a strong dependence on your Holy Spirit in this room today. I pray that we would just completely fix our eyes on you. We would completely understand exactly how you would want to use us in our circles, our circles of home and school, the clubs and organizations, our places of work, God in this world. You have such a greater call on who we are. You have such a greater purpose on who we are. And I just pray that you would open our eyes to that. And in these moments, I just pray that we would give you complete glory, complete appreciation. Jesus, completely humble before you. Yes, we will look even more foolish than this. We'll be even more undignified to the people of the world because it advances your kingdom and it brings eyes to what you've done through us. Jesus, you don't need us. You just need our voices. You just need our cooperation. You just need our, our obedience to say yes to you. And I pray that for everyone here this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't. of our worship team and the um, crew here this morning. We just wanted to welcome you, and uh, we're excited to see you this bright, sunny Sunday morning. Um, when you came in today, you got an information card. looks like this. Um, on the back of it has an uh, opportunity. Let me turn it right side up. For you to fill out, um, you can put your information here. If you're new here today, we'd encourage you to go ahead and fill that out. Mark the box. Put your information in there. Put it in the black box on your way uh, as the black box is passed today. And on your way out, if you would go straight out to the green wall, we have a gift for you. We want to meet you. We're excited for you to be here. We want to provide you some more information about things that are going on around here at the Fields Church and help you to get plugged in. Um, speaking of, there's another way to get plugged in. You can go online to thefields.guide. We also have information out on our website there about things that are going on, groups, ways to plug in, community events, things that are coming up, Easter services, the whole nine yards. Um, we have a couple more announcements for you, so if you turn your attention to the screens, I'd appreciate it. Happy Sunday. Welcome to The Fields. We're glad that you're able to join us this Sunday. Our hope is that you feel welcomed, and this morning you experience a real and loving God. Today we're continuing our series called Win the Day. Imagine how much better your life would be if, instead of obsessing over the past or worrying about the future, you set out to win today every day. We'll be providing practical ways each week of how you can win the day. And before we continue our service, we'd like to take a few minutes now and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around here. Easter at the Fields is next month, and this year we're going to be having six different Easter egg hunts for families. Next week, you can drop off a bag of candy in the lobby to be a part of filling over 5,000 eggs that will be hidden on Easter. Growth Track guides you to discover your redemptive purpose and live the life God created for you. The Growth Track is made up of three steps that equip you to, number one, connect to the church, 
Number two, discover the strengths of your purposeful design. Number three, develop your God-given gifts to make a difference in the lives of others. Step three is happening tonight at 6 p.m. and you can RSVP online at thefields.church. Well, thank you for your continued generosity at The Fields. As part of continuing to follow Jesus with every area of your life, we encourage you to give generously. Your giving advances God's kingdom through our church, our community, and our world. You can give at the end of the service or anytime at thefields.church. And thanks so much for being here with us today. If you are newer to The Fields, we have a small gift for you this morning. Take your info card to the welcome area in the lobby following the service for your gift. We're here to serve you today. If you have any questions or needs, our Dream Teamers wearing green shirts can help you in any way while you're here. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? How are your brackets going? Did anybody see St. Peter come in this weekend? <laughs> I did not. That was, it's been an amazing weekend. Well, my name is Samantha. I'm the next gym pastor here at the Fields Church, and I serve on our central team. I oversee vision, curriculum, and policy for age 0 to 18, so that is diapers to high school diplomas. Um, and what that really means is that I work alongside of our amazing team in Orange. If you see our amazing team in Orange, give them a high five today. They're, they're like fantastic. Tell them they're doing a great job. <laughs> but I oversee, I oversee and I work alongside that team uh, to help create experiences where kids know that they're not only at the Fields Church, but we're also going to align them at every phase to be able to know a personal relationship with God and follow Jesus with their life. Um, hopefully by the time they graduate high school, that's our goal. And that's what we work for every Sunday alongside of you amazing parents and grandparents at home. So what an honor to serve at the Fields Church. Well, we want to celebrate before we get started water baptism. Hopefully we're here last week. We had 19 water baptisms between 19 and uh, between Mattoon and Charleston. <laughs> Super incredible. Guys, this is, uh, this is Bob. And so when he came out of the tank in Charleston, he came out of the tank yelling, freedom! Like he was Braveheart. Like the video is incredible. If you get to see it, it's worth it. But this is Bob. Uh, so he's just one of 19 stories. And this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of the work that God is doing in someone's life when they take their next step to publicly declare their faith. So thank you for being a part of writing these stories in people's lives. So today... We are continuing a series called Win the Day, and you're probably wondering why I brought my kite, uh, but we are doing a quick, uh, just a quick review of the last couple of weeks. We talked about kissing the wave in week one. In week two, we talked about eating the frog, doing the, doing the hard things first each and every day. Today, we're talking about flying the kite, and to begin our story on November 9th, 1847, a civil engineer named Charles Ellett Jr. was commissioned to build a bridge over the Niagara Gorge. Um, so no big deal, right? Except for it was an 825-foot chasm. And on each side of it stood a 225-foot cliff. And so he's trying to figure out, how am I supposed to get a string from point A to point B? And so Theodore Graves Hollett, he's a local iron worker, he said, well... <laughs> 
get this, let's, let's do a kite flying contest. All the preschool and moms in the room just said that's a terrible idea, right? Have you ever taken your preschooler kite flying? <laughs> but 10 year, or 15 year old Homan Walsh later won a $10 prize figuring out how to get his kite across the 825 foot chasm and bridging the gap between the two cliffs. What's incredible is the next day, they took a stronger line, attached it to the kite string, and ran it across the, ki- the cliffs. Then they took 36 10 gauge wires, attached it to that rope, and ran it across the kite string, becoming the first railway suspension bridge connecting those two cliffs, supporting a 170 ton locomotive. And it all started with a kite string because it always does. It always starts with a small habit or something small. We cannot despise the day of small beginnings because if you do little things like they're big things, God will do big things in your life like they're little things. And I learned this probably, I, don't, I wouldn't say the hard way, but I learned this in ROTC in high school. Um, I was not an athletic kid, but when I got to my freshman year, my friend said, hey, I'm going to join the drill team. And so the drill team is, uh, it's an exhibition platoon or squad. And so you've probably seen like the Marine Corps silent drill team. It's about a 10-pound rifle. They spin, they do all kinds of choreographed movements, and it's about a 10-minute routine. And I thought, well, if she's doing that, I'm doing it, um, right? Because that's what you do in high school. <laughs> and so Through that experience, I made the team. She ended up like saying, no, I'm really not interested in this, but I went on to do it. (laughs) And I learned that successful people really start their day before the sunrise every day. We had practices every morning at 6 a.m. I learned that can't means won't. I learned that discipline is not the enemy of enthusiasm. And I learned that how you practice is how you're going to perform. And you can be the best no matter what you choose to be. We run a wide gamut of professions in this room. And I always remember him saying, whether you become the trash man or you become the president, I need you to be the best trash man or president that you can be. Bring your best to the table. But how does that, how does that come to a kite string? Well, my kite string was this little torch of knowledge. And in, and in a funny like twist of events, I lost this thing this morning. I didn't even know if I would have this to show you. <laughs> but this was the torch of knowledge. And these were, they would go on the lapel of the ugliest green uniform you ever did lay your eyes on. Um, (laughs) ROTC people right here. (laughs) But they're covered in lacquer when you get them. And so you've got to get all that lacquer off so you can make the brass shine. And so it comes apart. There were a couple tricks to it. This back comes off. This torch comes out. And you've got to find your old pair of denim cutoffs that don't fit anymore, your 33-cent can of Brasso, which was a one-time ROTC investment. And you scrubbed and you scrubbed and you scrubbed until the lacquer came off. And that took probably a good two weeks of scrubbing every night until I made that thing shine the way that I really wanted it to. After that, you would have to put it back together without getting all of the fingerprints on it. You would have to position it about five-eighths from both collars that had to sit kind of in the center. And the bottom of this torch had to point to the top button um, without being too angled in. Like, it had to make like a perfect angle pointing down to the top button of your uniform. And why do I tell you all of that? (laughs) Because I learned with this, how you do anything is how you do everything. It started with this piece because I had to have this piece to make my uniform on point. If my uniform wasn't on point, my grade dropped. I was no longer eligible to perform on the exhibition platoon, which was my end goal. It set an example for other students. The other students who didn't take the time to take it apart, but put their uniform together one time and then just tried to like leave it on there and shine it along the way. (laughs) Because there are people that will take the easy way out, right? But I learned that how you do anything is how you do everything. My husband is a production manager at a local car park facility, and and I, I, I can always tell what kind of worker he's telling me a story about because there's a clear difference between people who show up to make a car part and a person who shows up to make a car part, and they understand that the car part is going on to a car which is going on to a car lot, which is one day going to drive your family to church on Sunday morning. There's a big difference in how those employees operate. Because the employee that takes the time to pay attention for a micron-sized detail and a deficiency, they understand that how you do anything is how you'll do everything. 
I keep a marble jar on our counter for my kids because it helps me keep a countdown of when they graduate from high school. And why do I do that? Because it helps remind me I only have 936 weeks from the time they're a baby to the time that they graduate. And when I understand the time that I have left, I'll do a whole lot more with the time that I have right now. I'll understand that my years are short, my days are long, but every day matters when I'm raising my kids. And so, just saying all of that, if you brought your Bible, if you want to pull up, pull that out, you can meet me in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. But continuing to unpack the idea of the flying kite, I was just hoping that we could be a little bit honest with each other because we make a lot of excuses. I make a lot of excuses sometimes. First one being, when I have a little bit more money, I'll start to give, right? Well, I don't buy that because if we're not generous with what we have in our time and our talent and our treasure today, even if it's a little, we're not going to be generous with our time and talent and treasure when it's a lot. It's not in us. We know a lot of people who say, you know what, I'm going to serve when I have more time. But the truth about that is we make time for what's important. Can we just agree about that? Can we be real honest about that as we just go on through the day? If it's important, we'll make time for it. I know people who are waiting on a big opportunity to step up. I'll step up when the big opportunity comes. But here's the secret. The people that are sitting on the bench don't ever get to take part in the game-winning play. It doesn't happen. Big opportunities don't come to people who are waiting on the sidelines for them to happen. Big opportunities happen to people who are already in the game. They're already competing. They're already performing. They're already taking part in doing the little things. If you're faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with a lot. Show me the size of your dream, I'll show you the size of your God, right? And I say go for it. If you want to try a God-sized dream, a God-sized dream that you will only fail doing without divine intervention, go for it. But you can't just dream big. You have to start small. You have to think long. And that's what flying the kite's truly about. And so before we go on, before we get into Meet Zachariah, I just wanted to take a second and think about what is your dream today? What goal are you trying to reach? And I was wrapping my head around this. I was just thinking of just some phase, phase goals I've had throughout my life. When I was a new mom, like my goal was to get my kids to sleep through the night in their own bed, right? Anybody else? <laughs> Please let them sleep through the night in their own bed. Those goals eventually turned into job promotions. Um, God, give me the next advancement. Give me the next opportunity. Those goals became growing closer to God, leading my kids um, in a faith that would last forever, uh, my marriage, paying off debt. I, I've had lots of goals, and I imagine you do too, but what is the goal that you're bringing to the table today? I don't think there's one that's too big or too small. We represent a lot of people doing a lot of different things. We have people doing visionary movements in the community today, and we have moms that are literally just saying, I just want to make it to the end of today, <laughs> right? Can we just be honest about that? So as we get to Zechariah, I kind of love how he is a prophet to a discouraged nation of Israel. He understands the discouragement. He served in Jerusalem as a priest and a prophet after the exile of the Israelites. So this is a point where the Israelites were taken out of their homeland, brought into foreign lands. Now they've been given the opportunity to return. And in Jerusalem, only a remnant of people remained. So the walls of the city are torn down. The temple is gone. The beautiful temple that Solomon built is gone. A temple currently stands on site that's needing rebuilt, but it doesn't, it, it'll just never quite reach that, that end goal of Solomon's temple. They know it needs rebuilding, but it'll never quite be as beautiful as what it was. And at this point, these people really truly feel like God has stepped away, God has abandoned us, we're not hearing from him. But Zechariah encourages God's people to rebuild the temple. And God is actually speaking to Zechariah, and in this book, he gives him eight messages to give to the people of Israel to tell them to continue going and to continue working until the work is completed. And so in 4.6, we read, then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. Everybody say Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. I was, you're going to have to. It just makes you smile, right? Zerubbabel's a commander. <laughs> it's a real name. Uh, it is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. 
Zerubbabel's the leader of a remnant people who have returned to Judah with a God-sized vision to rebuild the temple, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar about a half a century earlier. And this is when the Lord says to Zerubbabel, it's not, it's not you that's going to do it. It's going to be done in my strength. And I think sometimes we need to hear that, right? It's not us that has to do it. It's going to be done in God's strength. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we are average. But with the Holy Spirit, we're able to achieve the impossible. We talked about amazing, the amazing testimonies of water baptism, the outward expression of the inward change. But the Holy Spirit is inwardly changing us to create an outward expression. He's inwardly changing us to do things that we never dreamed and we never imagined. And why would he choose to do that through us? Because we're pointing back to him and we're, we're, we're acknowledging, God, it's you and me. It, it's all about you. Because when we do the things that we don't think that we can do and the Holy Spirit works in us to do them, all we can do is point back to God and say, only you. Right? Anybody feel that? <laughs> he wants the glory. So in verse 7, we read, Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it. May God bless it. What are you, mighty mountain? This is kind of fantastic that he's talking to a mountain, right? But sometimes we've got to stop complaining to God about how big our mountain is. And sometimes we've got to start talking to our mountains about how big our God is. The faith of a mustard seed will move a mighty mountain. In this case, God says, you'll level that thing. It'll be flat. What an impossible thought. But we see a few habits come into play here. The first one is flipping the script. Because now we're at a point where we've got to declare his power, declare his grace. We've got to declare his peace and his love and his goodness his healing. We don't deny that there's an obstacle, but we, can, we, we do confront the fact with an unwavering faith. God's going to move that mountain. We don't lose faith at the end of the story. And as you exercise your authority as a child of God and as a citizen of heaven, we're given the same authority that Christ used, the same power in us that raised Christ from the dead. It exists. We have God's authority. We kiss the wave. We learned about that just a couple weeks ago. The obstacle's not the men enemy, the obstacle's the way. The bigger the mountain you encounter, the bigger person you become on the other side. You learn the lesson, you cultivate character, you curate change, you go through the mountain, you go over the mountain, whatever you've got to do. But the mountains become an intricate part of your story, and that will eventually help someone else along the way. And then we eat the frog. Zerubbabel knows that if he wants God to do the supernatural, he's got to do the natural. He's got to pick up the hammer, and he's got to start doing the work. In verse 8 to 10, we start to fly the kite, because Zechariah says, Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. And then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin and to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. So here's a plumb line. I'm using way too many illustrations with strings this morning. Here's the plumb line. So it's an ancient measuring device. The only thing in Zerubbabel's hand right now is this plumb line. He's not started. He hasn't approached the city about building permits. He doesn't have blueprints. He's not broken ground. He's literally standing there holding this plumb line, and God is applauding. And the question is why? Because God is not only great because he celebrates the big things, but God is great because he celebrates the little things. He celebrates when we start and we take that next step of faith. Small steps of faith and small steps of kindness bring grand applause from God. I think that we're easily overwhelmed sometimes by the size and the scope of our goals that God has given us. It's probably why 75% of New Year's resolutions fail, because we don't start. Anybody feel that? <laughs> I still haven't started mine. <laughs> and we can't finish what we don't start. So it doesn't matter what your goal is. That goal that I had you think about, um, whether that's it's changing a new attitude in your home, restarting your marriage, running a 5K, running a marathon, taking that new job promotion, whatever God-sized dream is in your heart, you've got to reverse engineer the goal so that it'll become a daily habit. 
So the three keys to flying the kite, are you ready for them? This is time to take your notes. <laughs> give yourself a deadline and give yourself a start date. So just, um, I, I would say two years, my eighth grader, Maddie, um, she has had on her mind to have a campus club ministry. Um, and there was FCA at the middle school. She's in eighth grade. And that kind of fell apart with COVID and shelter in place. And so she kept saying, we need to do this. We need to do that. And I kept telling her, we don't have the authority to this. And we don't have the authority to do that. We've got to just wait on the process. And so actually just right around, I think it was this President's Day weekend, we actually got to meet with our Youth Alive missionaries, uh, Billy and Katie Willis. And so Maddie met with four of her friends at Starbucks, and we dreamed about what a Youth Alive would look like at Mattoon Middle School. And because Billy and Katie are really also getting started, they've got a God-sized dream to launch five Youth Alive organizations before the end of the school year. And so they said, well, let's, let's circle a date on the calendar. And so we did. It's February 18th, 19th, it's somewhere in there. We circle March 16th. My heart stops because I'm looking at my calendar and I'm literally going, I do not have time. My heart's racing. I'm freaking out thinking I got to help them lead this thing. But we say March 16th. So a week later, thanks to a snow day, they're meeting with their principal. And their principal says, hey, you've got to create a sustainable, you've got to create a sustainable club. This thing's got to last till next year. You're all in eighth grade. What are you going to do about it? A week later... The launch team's established now with four eighth graders, three sixth graders, and three teacher sponsors. Because when you start moving, God starts putting the pieces into place if it's his plan and his purpose. And so then, not even four days later, this last Wednesday, they launched their first Youth Alive Club. Now with these wonderful crew of students and four teacher sponsors. And it's an incredible movement of what it looks like when you circle a start date and you set a deadline. Because when we set the deadline, we had to start. We knew we had to do work to make it happen by that March 16th date. We had people holding us accountable in the process. We often make excuses. You know, it's easy, you work for a church, right? You can make those things happen. We, we say things like, I'm not qualified though. But God doesn't equip, God doesn't call the qualified. God equips the called. He equips those that walk up to him and say, yes, I'm going to step out. I'm going to serve on your behalf. I'm going to do what you need me to do. And God says, here are the tools that you need. I've given you the helper in my Holy Spirit. Let's go accomplish a God-sized dream together. You don't have to be qualified. I'm not ready. Well, can I be really honest with you? <laughs> I was never ready to stand on the stage and speak. This was a vision God gave me when I was little. I used to picture standing in front of the stage to speak, but I was the first one that took the out on speech class. It was not my thing. I hate public speaking. <laughs> it took me about a year of even doing hosting before I could walk off the stage and my hands were not trembling nonstop. But what we give to the Holy Spirit, he will make us ready and he will equip us and he will give us what we need to follow through the things we're not ready for. None of us are ready. And I saw this quote just last night, because God's good this way. If it excites you and it scares the life out of you at the same time, you should probably do it. What excites you and what is scaring the life out of you right now? You might be waiting for the right situation, and aren't we all waiting for the right situation, the right time, the right place? George Bernard Shaw says people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. But the people who get on in this world are people who get up, they look for the circumstances they want, and if they can't find the circumstances they want, they make them. So what circumstances do you need to make to change your world today? The second key to flying the kite, dream big, but start small. Go public, tell somebody what you're gonna do. If you've made a decision to make a small step to advance toward a goal and chase something down, tell somebody about it. Invite them along with you. When I started running a few years back, I'm not a runner, um, but I wasn't a runner. Um, but I told my husband, because I knew he'd hold me accountable, I said, I want to start running, and I'm hoping you'll go with me. And so the first thing I did after that was downloaded the Couch to 5K app. The second thing I did was signed up for a 5K. Start date, deadline, right? <laughs> Tell somebody about it. Invite somebody that's going to hold you accountable. And then reverse engineer your plan. Keeping the end in mind but think, what do I need to start today? So if I want a better marriage, I have to start thinking, how did I greet my spouse when he walked in the door today after a long day at work? 
What was his initial greeting from me? How did I greet my kids today when they walked in the door from school? Was I open and was I listening or was I closed off and tired? I want a promotion at work. Ask your boss for feedback. What is it about me that would make me promotable? What is it about me that makes me unpromotable? And apply those changes. Work in your strengths, make some changes. Say it out loud. I want to lose some weight, start drinking more water. Join a, waiting, a weight loss plan. Start moving more. Pick something small. You might be saying, I want to plug into a community. I'm going to get to know more people. I feel like I'm on an island. Join a group. Join Growth Track. Join a serving team. Around here, you'll hear a question, and this is a question that I've actually taken home with me because it's one, I, it's one that I really, really like. But it's, what, in, what can I do in this moment that will make the most impact? Oftentimes, if I'm being really, really honest, my to-do list is way longer than the time that I have to achieve it. Um, between home, ministry, family, community, I can't do it all. And so there's so many times where I stop and I ask myself, what can I do in this moment that's going to have the greatest impact? And that helps me define that small step, that small kite string that I need to start building on for my day. Because when I identify the thing that's going to make the biggest impact, the small thing, it's funny how God aligns everything else and puts my day back in order when I give it to him in that moment. I love the moment when the pipe dream becomes the reality. Has anybody ever had that? <laughs> when something you've dreamed about finally happens. The ground breaks, the movement starts, you cut the ribbon. I love that moment because you're pinching yourself saying, is this real? How is this real? And I got to hear my eighth grader say this week, I've dreamed about a Youth Alive club now for two years. I've dreamed about a campus club for two years. It's finally happening. I can't even believe it. Guys, that's worth it. God wants us to chase and to have those pipe dream moments where we're saying, is this really happening? Is this really my life? Because we don't follow a dull God. We follow a God of a big picture adventure. We really do. The last one, if you want every day to count, count the days. So what small steps today can you put into place to create a winning streak? We're talking about streaks a lot, right? Um, we see them on, I see it on my Kindle app. If I'm reading every day, my Kindle app keeps track of my days and my weeks that I'm reading. I don't want to break that streak. That's like hard one. Um, but we have a church member right now who's currently on a winning streak of attending the YMCA every week. If you watch her Facebook page, I think she's up to 45 straight weeks of going to the Y every morning at 5 or 5.15. I guarantee you she's feeling the health benefits. I guarantee you she's seeing positive life change from that choice. But she's celebrating the thing that she can count because she's counting the days. There's power there. If you know someone in AA or Narcotics Anonymous and you, you ask them, how many days have you been sober? They can tell you. They can tell you how many days, how many weeks, how many months, how many years, because they understand the tremendous impact of counting the days keeps them sober and keeps them free and keeps their life moving on the pace that they want it to move. Wake up with a mindset, I can do anything for one day. If you wake up with that mindset tomorrow, I can do anything for one day, and then you wake up again on Tuesday and say, I can do anything for one day, and you keep waking up with that mindset, all of a sudden you've created a winning streak. And you've got to count the days. Much like counting calories is important if you're on a diet, counting the days is absolutely critical if you're trying to achieve a daily routine and a daily habit. There are just moments in your life where you have to fly the kite and you never really know what the single kite string could be a suspension branch to something greater. You never know when the suspension bridge is going to build off of the daily habits that you've built and that you've gathered. So what kite string are you holding in your hand today? What plumb line are you holding in your hand today? What's the small change at home or at work or at school to create a long-term impact? I was so challenged by one of the ladies of our group. She's actually a great grandma. It's a parenting group, parenting group for parents of teenagers, but she's actually great grandma. And she wants to have a great relationship with her great grandkids. She's got a daily relationship. She's daily in and out. And she understands that she's far enough away from them that she's not going to have good communication skills with them. She's not going to be able to relate to them until she does a little bit of work on how to understand this generation and how to know a little bit more about what they're going through. So she's taking a group 
much to her own like fear and anxiety. And she openly admitted, I only started because Travis did the one year challenge. I only asked because I asked my friends and said, what do you think? Do you think they'll accept me? Do you think they'll let me in? I think it's incredible. A great grandma in my group who wants to connect with her grandkids. You might be somebody who today says, you know, Travis said a few weeks back um, to do something for a year. Maybe that was a daily devotion. Maybe join a team, a group, growth track, um, and you haven't done it yet. And that's okay. Maybe today is the day that you actually check the box and say, I'm going to take that next step. What are you holding in your hand that God wants access to? But today you might be somebody who just needs to take the very next step to follow Jesus. It might be um, the very first time that you've been invited to do that. It might be the hundredth time. But you can't have a real relationship with Jesus. You can't have a spirit-empowered life without following Jesus with your life, without having a real relationship with your Savior who paid for your life on the cross. It can't happen. Maybe that's your next step. And don't get confused. I think as we talk about the spirit working in us and the activities that we do, God... God could really care less about the things that we build in his name. He's excited. He's excited when we rebuild the temple. He's excited when we start the campus club. But what he wants from us more than anything is that real intimate relationship, that Kinesco relationship that Pastor Travis talked about several weeks ago, an intimacy and knowing him. God would desire that far more than anything else we could ever do for him. But when we decide to follow him and we we chase him with our lives and we give him our best yes, God will do things in our life that we can never ask, dream, or imagine on our best days. So I want to pray for those of us who need to accept Jesus for the first time. I want to pray for those of us that uh, maybe need to get back into a right relationship with Jesus. Maybe we've walked away, but I want to pray for those today. Jesus, we just lift you up. We thank you that you paid, or you paid our debt on a cross that we could never pay. And there's nothing that we could ever do for you to repay it but you choose to use us. Faith is alive in us when we choose to follow you. Your spirit is alive in us when we choose to follow you. And Jesus, I just pray that you would bring us to a place where we would just commit our lives to you. We would just put ourselves humbly before your throne. I pray we could picture standing before your cross and you saying it is forgiven. As far as the east is from the rest, you can begin new today. Leave your sin, leave your your shame, leave it all right here at the foot of the cross and follow me with your life forever. Jesus, I just pray for those. I pray for those that are making that decision today. God, that you would surround them. You would just help them to know you, help them to sense your presence. We pray for a sensitivity to your spirit, God, that we would just continue to say yes to you in the little things each and every day. How you're going to do everything. So just in this final moments as we close, I'm just going to ask you guys, as we're singing, think about that thing that the Spirit wants to reignite inside of you, that dream that's dead, the thing that you might have thought is a pipe dream, that God would give you a new passion for that. I would ask that God would help you to take your next step. What small step right now in this moment can I make that's going to make the greatest trajectory of impact on my life? I challenge you to pray that this morning. What small step can I take right now that's going to make the greatest impact? You're in a safe space. I'm going to pray for us. But in the meantime, after that, man, let's go fly a kite. Let's do it. (laughs) Jesus, thank you. I thank you for just these incredible people. I thank you for, for moms and for dads who are raising young families. I thank you for the phases and the seasons. I thank you for grandmas and grandpas, aunts, uncles. Jesus, I pray for parents that are in the teen years and for those that are empty nesting. And God, I pray for those that are starting to realize long hidden dreams coming to life. And I pray for those that haven't seen any movement yet. We're all in an incredible phase, but I pray in this moment that you would show us a small step we could take to move just a little bit closer, just a little bit nearer to that dream or to that goal that you have for us. I thank you for every life here. I thank you for the incredible way that you want to use us. I thank you that you even want to use us. We're broken vessels, but you make us whole, God. You make us complete. You lead through us, and you choose to do that. You could do it on your own, but you choose to use us. God, you don't need us but you need our voices, you need our obedience, you need our willingness just to follow you. And I pray for the courage that we would do that today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand and sing this last song with us?
no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. You won't kick down, lie, you won't tear down, come back to me. It can be a small one, but I ask God that you would encourage us to make that step to further our relationship with you, to meet our goals, to set big dreams, God, that you can help us obtain. Thank you for all of these things in your word today. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. A couple of things. If you made a first-time commitment today to connect with Christ or to reconnect with Christ, we want to know about it. We want to excite, we're excited for you. We want to celebrate with you. We want to encourage you. We want to provide you with more information to help you with that next step. So if you would go ahead on these info cards again, because we're going to talk about these again, on the info card, mark that you made that decision today, and we're going to come alongside you and partner with you and cheer you on, because we are excited for that with you. Easter's coming. I don't know about you guys, but I'm so excited. We're coming into that time of the year where we get to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, where we get to spend that time together as a church family rejoicing. Um, our Easter services are going to be on the 16th and the 17th. Um, so now's the time to start thinking about, first off, which one you're going to attend. Secondly, who you're going to invite, because this is a great time to invite other people. This is one of the most common times of the year that somebody who doesn't regularly attend church comes. Easter and Christmas, those are the big ones, right? So think about who in your life you know that you want to invite and encourage to come, because once they come, I mean, look, you're here again every week, right? You know, once they get in the doors. They're going to love it here, and we want to encourage more people to be in attendance and to hear the wonderful news. 
Also, if you've been here before at Easter, you know that we do some fun things with our Easter services, and afterwards we do a giant Easter egg hunt after both services, weather permitting, um, for the kids in our church. So um, with that comes a lot of need for volunteers, a lot of need for eggs, and a lot of need for candy. So if you can think about it, the next couple of weeks when you come in, bring a bag of candy. We would really appreciate your help with that. There'll be a, a drop box out in the lobby that you can put it in that will help us to turn around. And you'll, I mean, you'll get some of it back, right? The kids are going to go crazy for those eggs. Um, so if you could bring some, that would be great. Next up, um, in a minute here, the um, guest services team is going to pass the black boxes around again. Mark on there if you're new here. We want to know you. We want to come celebrate with you. Mark on there if you've made a decision for Christ. We want to celebrate that too. Um, but also, this is our opportunity and time during service for us to give, um, to, to give back to, to God's kingdom. I think a lot of times the mentality with tithing and offerings and giving kind of feels a little bit like, oh, here we go again. It's like tax season. we got to give something. That is not the intent. When we ask you to give, it's not meant to be a tax. It's not meant to be a punishment. We're not looking to make money off of you. Just the opposite. God calls us to give as a part of his commandments. We want to give and we want to encourage you to give to celebrate what God has done for you. Because when you give back to God, it allows those blessings to be multiplied throughout his kingdom. Locally here at the Fields Church, that allows us to equip ministry outreaches both locally with you know, community projects like Easter services, but also with our missions that we support both nationally and internationally. Deuteronomy 16, 17 says, all must give as they are able according to the blessings that God has given to them. So we're called to give because God has blessed us. And actually, we're called to give right off the top, not what's left over, but the first of our bounty that God gives us. And now some of you may be saying, listen, inflation being what it is, gas prices being what it is, there's not a lot of bounty to go around. I get it. But you know what? If you remember the story about the woman in the, in the market square that didn't have but a penny to give, right? She, was, she gave what she had. It's not about the dollar amount. It's about the heart and the intention. And the heart is to give back back to God as a praise, as a worship, as a thank you for what you're doing in my life. And all of us have something that we can be thankful for. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's biblical. So I would encourage you guys to give. Everybody has the opportunity to do it. If you've never done it before, what better way to further your spiritual walk than to follow his commandments and to give back so that those blessings can be passed on to other people? Um, I don't know about you, there have been times in the past where financially things were a little grim, right? Like it was tight and, I, and we didn't really have what we wanted to be able to give. But you know what? You can't outgive God. When you have a need, even if it's financial, and you still step out on faith and you give back to his kingdom, he will bless you tenfold. He will find a way to meet your financial needs. I've had that happen personally in my life a number of times. So I would encourage you to go ahead and, and give. You can give either in the box if you're like, ooh, I didn't bring anything today. You can give online at thefields.guide. Um, but I'd encourage you to do that because it's important for your spiritual walk. It's not about what we get from you. It's what you're getting from God and allowing to then be blessed back into his kingdom. God, thank you for an amazing Sunday. Thank you for the beautiful warm weather. Thank you for the upcoming season of, of Easter and the dedication that God has shown to us and the, and the resurrection of Christ. Thank you, God, for the challenges to move forward in little steps today in our walk with you. And I ask, God, that you would bless those that give and that are here this week and help us to have a great week and bring us back safely next week. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a great week.